YouTube. Hello. Welcome back to the life and suffering of Sir Brant. Take dos. As always, if you guys enjoy the content, feel free to like, feel free to subscribe, feel free to leave a comment or not. Either way, let's play. Continue. Wait. Uh, why do I have multiple at the end of time? Childhood. I'm, I'm, mm, this one I think is the one I wanted. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I have the right one. We should be at the end of childhood here. Yes. Well, you're 1,125. Childhood's end. The mark left on you by the sacrament takes a long, long time to heal. Mother says it is a reminder of your lot. Suffering and sufferance, pain and patience. Gloria shows you the mark of the lash on her shoulder one day. It will never disappear. You are a commoner now. This is the lot you were born into. But father keeps telling you to study hard so you may you may yet earn a different lot and become noble of the mantle. I have noticed one thing in my on my playthroughs that I have a tendency to read way too fast. I'm going to try to slow it down a little bit. I'm a naturally fast talker. You recall the past with warm sadness when Stefan still lived with you or when he wrote to you for a time shortly after he left. Now he thinks it beneath him to write to the commoners in his family. Mother didn't lock herself in the bedroom as often back then. This changed shortly before Nathan was born. But most importantly, you missed a time before the terrifying figure of your grandfather was constantly looming over you. You learned the true power of the lot only after the head of family's arrival. In grandfather's eyes, no commoner deserves to be treated with kindness. Is this just him or is it the way of the entire world? The very thought makes you queasy. You are older now, and what's more, you are an elder brother now. You've learned how to care about someone else, how to teach and protect. Soon, you are a small boy no longer. As the days pass, play gradually gives way to, way to laborious study. Now your choices will decide your place in the bizarre and ruthless world of adulthood. Your childhood years are over. Side note, I do get myself a little bit of a hot chocolate, you know, a little bit of the old Baileys in it, a little adult beverage here. Let us begin. I think we're on to adolescence now. Wait. Personal qualities that you have accumulated in childhood, they will convert into adult qualities at the end of the chapter two. Adolescence, determination, resolute, perceptive. I am very inattentive. We get a big old fat zero for perception. And our willpower is very much a zero. We need to start saving up more willpower, real talk. Let us begin our adolescence. Eight years of age. Reading a book under a tree. I was growing up fast. The school, the streets, and the whole wide world awaited me beyond the gate of my parents' house. I wish I had a voice like this guy. I really do. Chapter 2, Adolescence. You live long in this world for eight years now. As you grow older, life grows more complex. The world of your childhood was limited to your house and family, but now that realm is expanding. It also includes your neighborhood, the nearby houses, the streets of the ancient city of Anazot. A question now looms over you, growing more pressing with each passing year. What will your place be in this vast outside world? Few people in the blessed Arknean Empire trouble themselves with this question. It's not within a man or woman's power to choose. Their destiny is predetermined by their birth and those who bore them. And yet, your peculiar birth has granted you a choice. Your father is a man of nobility, a worthy example, example in matters of duty and honor. Your mother is a commoner of lowly estate, humility and patience made flesh. And your sky is ablaze day and night with the light of the shining pillar, the beacon of the clergy. Your back bears the mark of the lash. Will you accept the drudgery suffering that is the lot of the blowborn of your entire life? For your entire life, that is. Or will you follow in the footsteps of your father and your father's father and fight for the right to serve the empire as a noble of the mantle? That is the end game. Perhaps will you follow the twin god's word and offer spiritual guidance to others? The answer lies out there in that vast, terrifying world. What awaits you beyond the walls of your home? Hold on one second. Kiddo, come here. Kiddo, come here. 
Really, really fast. Really, really fast. Can you say chapter two? Chapter two. Adolescence. Adolescence. All right, all right, go on, go on, go on, go on, go on. Ugh. She wanted to contribute. She wanted to contribute. All right, so we have the uh, Glorious Secret, which we need ingenuity above four. Stefan's Disgrace, which is nobility above four. Wait, you find out about your elder brother's forbidden love. Blood Tide. Uh, participate in the ritual and Gregor Brandt above two. That's not going to happen. And Nathan's Admonition. Your younger brother Nathan receives a spiritual admonition for you. Spirituality above four. That's probably where I went wrong with Nathan, is I don't really care about my side of the spirituality in this game. Bent in the personal life, matters of the heart. You experience your first romantic feelings. You experience a revelation by the sacred tree. And Sophia saved. I don't know if I'm going to do that one this time. I'm trying to stockpile my lives. One of the biggest changes I made on this playthrough already is I've already pocketed one extra life compared to the first playthrough. Your personal qualities at this age, you determine which choices you may take. Nobility. We are unprincipled. Ingenuity. We are slow. Spirituality. We are mundane. I feel like a very gifted child right now. Willpower. Exhausted. Deaths. Untouched by death. The sections that open in this chapter... A whole bunch of stuff that I never look at anyway. Year 1126, adolescence, eight years of age. I do want to put this out here. All those people that have left comments on my on my gameplay to this point and have uh, liked and just kind of in general hung through the playthrough, I do greatly appreciate you guys. Love you guys and I hope you guys are having a wonderful day. The boy down the street. The family expects more and more of you as you grow up. The teachers and tutors hired by your father keep you on your toes all the time. Your life these days is dedicated to studying for your future, for the future of the Brandt family. Your younger brother Nathan keeps growing up too. He can hold a conversation now. You never refuse him when he comes to play, provided you have a bit of free time between your demanding lessons. It is a rainy day today. Yo, I love falling asleep to thunderstorms. Father and mother have gone to a ball and they left Nathan in your care. You lose track of time over the books in the sitting room and Nathan goes off alone to splash in the creek. Soon you hear his voice begging you to come outside. He is on the porch, sobbing, all covered in dirt. You walk up to him as he continues to ball. Nathan Brandt, it's all, it's all that kid. He pushed me into the ditch, called me names. He said I was a fancy pants fool. I said, I'll call my brother. He's still there. You have to go punish him, Dava Jr. Nathan points at a lopsided wooden house further down the street where the poorer artisans live. You see two boys lingering there on the porch. They are clearly both commoners, but far from poor. One of them is almost as tall as Nathan, and he frowns in a funny way, just like him. The other looks older, almost your age, but he is a more broad-shouldered and taller. His name is Tomas. You've heard it before. Hey, Tomas, what up, buddy? Nathan Brandt. There, Davin Jr., that's him. Nathan points at the younger boy and hides behind your back. Tomas grins and rolls up his sleeve to reveal strong forearms. He must have been helping his father with manual labor for quite some time. Tomas Guerrero. Listen up, rich boys. We don't give a damn about you or your friendship. We don't let nobody call our home a stinking rat hole. Your little brother earned his ditch dive. Maybe next time you'll dress normal and stop picking fights so people can throw them in the mud. Your hands clench into fists before you react. Nathan called them names first. No wonder they did the same. That's how it goes. But pushing your brother into a ditch is too much. Tomas stands tall and confident. He sees no threat in you. You are about to get ready for a fight when you feel a tug on your sleeve. You turn your head to see Nathan, the one who started the whole mess. It seems he has something important to tell you. Uh, I don't have the right relationship with him. Feels bad. Resolve the matter peacefully. Come at Thomas and give him a beating or say your brother is to blame. We're going to resolve the matter peacefully. I believe that's the same decision I made last game. I'm not trying to make wholesale changes on this playthrough. People are expecting a night and day playthrough. You guys are going to be disappointed, and I apologize. I'm trying to make certain small decisions differently so I can see how maybe my story might have ended if I had been able to survive through my last playthrough. So a lot of the decisions are going to be very similar. I'm just trying to save a few more lives. 
This quarrel can be resolved peacefully. He turned it to Moss and offered to solve the problem like adults. His brother will apologize to Nathan, and Nathan will apologize to him in return. There is no need to fight anymore. You'll give Nathan a piece of your mind when you get home. You and Tomas are all grown up and should act your age, you say. The blood rushes to Tomas's face when he hears this. Tomas Guerrero, act your age, you say. Are you calling me a baby? You better shut your trap. This is all he says before he attacks. You barely dodge a fist flying at your face. You start trading blows, huffing and puffing with rage. The younger brothers gawk in awe at the sight. Tomas does not resort to fancy moves, dirty tricks, or stupid taunts. He displays nothing but skill earned in as many a street fight, and his heavy fists aim for your head. You keep dodging him again and again like Muhammad Ali trying to reach him. Wait, Muhammad Ali doesn't exist in this universe. He takes a couple of glancing blows but easily shakes them off. What a bruiser. You start swinging your fists with greater and greater fury. Look like a butterfly, sting like a bee. My name is Muhammad Ali. Your heart is pounding like a hammer. You see nothing but the foe in front of you. How much longer will this take? You're worn out. Your breath grows ragged and your muscles grow heavy. But there is no way you can give up now. Nathan is watching you. Desperate and out of options. You swing and punch Tom Tomas square in the nose. Then they immediately let his fist smack you in the temple. The blow rings through your head like a bell and blinds you for a moment. The world swims before your eyes. You clutch at your head to get your bearings. Tomas is standing in front of you, blood dripping from his nose. You no longer want to fight it out, and it seems your opponent would rather end it too. But you keep standing there, eyeing each other angrily. Then suddenly, you hear an angry shout right next to you. An enraged man in a craftsman's apron is shaking his fist. Tomas's face contorts in terror right away. Tomas Guerrero. Oh, where's my drink? It's my father. Run! The punishment for fighting is flogging, and the mere prospect of that makes you run like the wind. Tomas sprints in front of you. You dash across the wooden planks of the back alley and up and over a lopsided fence, across a giant puddle in one leap, and then forward into the tall grass. You hide there and stay quiet. You hear no sounds of pursuit. You exchange glances with Tomas and start laughing. His laughter is loud and infectious, but soon he cuts it short and grows sadder. Tomas Guerrero. Eh, I'm gonna get flogged anyways. My dad's always quick to give me a beating, and then he'll start nagging me about the lots and the prayers for days like he always does. Why do I always get myself mixed up in this stuff? But fighting is the only way to prove you're worth anything, am I right? The adults didn't see you fighting, you tell them, so all you have to do now is convince them you weren't. Nosebleeds happen, right? Mother gets nosebleeds all the time. Foreshadowing. Tomas Guerrero. Well, we could try it. Let's hope our little brothers don't tell on us. I'll talk to mine. There's a scratch on your head. Don't let them see it. Good thing I didn't hit you in the face. There. Good as new. You assure him that Nathan will never tell, and in return, you'll make sure he behaves himself so he won't get tossed into a ditch again. With that, you shake hands with Tomas. His handshake is as strong as you would expect based on his fists. You make your way out of the tall grass. You need to leave before Tomas's father, her family, family, father, father, family, same difference, goes to your family and complains about you breaking your lot. You come to a realization on the way back. You had no idea the place you were hiding even existed, and it wasn't too far from home. Tomas smiles in excitement when he hears this. Tomas Quiero. Oh, I know lots of places like that. I'll tell you what, if we get out of this mess today, I'll show you the way to the old fortress wall. It's the perfect place to build your own fort. I dragged a bunch of wooden planks there. Too bad it's no fun to build alone. My brother never helps. He just gets in the way. You emerge from the muddy back alleys, united by a secret only the two of you know. It seems you've made a friend today. Hey, plus one, a difference. Spirituality plus one. I don't care about my spirituality. Met Tomas, year 1126. You've made a friend, a boy named Tomas. Sounds like the name of a song. Do, do, do. Next page. Oh, nope. Year 1127. Adolescence. Age nine. Riders on the road. It is a blistering hot today, even for the sun parched land of Magra. 
As soon as you are done with your studies, you dash outdoors and out of the stuffy room. You and Tomas roll up your shirt sleeves, but it barely helps. You would, gl you, mm, you would gladly go shirtless had you only been in the company of other boys. But there are three girls in the yard today. They are doing the laundry in a big wash tub, whispering and giggling. If you could, you would gladly keep watching one of them at work. She has big eyes of deep blue. Her dark hair is braided, and her plain gray dress is mended and patched all over. Her name is Sophia. She throws her head back a little when she laughs. The rays of the sun are reflected in her eyes. You, Tomas, and the other boys keep telling silly stories. Anything to make her laugh. Sophia, you sure love telling old tell tales there, Davin Jr. Oh, I remember this one time. But then Sophia hears a voice calling her home. She nods to you and runs across the street, smiling. Her light steps carry her forward, but her eyes are looking elsewhere. But then, a stone on the road catches her foot. She stumbles and falls flat into the dust. The street starts shaking from the thundering of hooves. Riders appear on the road from around the corner. They bear a coat of arms you recognize right away. A sable serpent blade upon a field of vert. It symbolizes the Melanidus dynasty, the family of your province's archduke. The horses dash forward. A lost wooden toy on the road cracks under their hooves. They will not slow down. They are the nobles, and the rest must make way for them. Sophia is in their way, just now starting to get back on her feet. Her mother is crying for her desperately from behind the fence door. You freeze in terror. The riders surely see the girl. Are they going to stop, or are they going to trample her? In only a few moments, the beautiful girl will be toppled, trampled, and crushed. Hey, uh, this is a difference from the first one. I have to stay where I am. I don't have enough willpower to do this. So I guess we're going to stay where we are. You stand frozen by the roadside, unable to look away as a cloud of dust covers the entire street. You feel as if a massive, maddened beast whipped into a merciless frenzy has just passed you by. You hear no screams, no cracking bones, nothing but the deafening din of the hooves. Once the horses are gone and the dust settles, you can finally see the road again and the repulsive blob of blood, flesh, and bone left on it. You can still see traces of Sophia in that mess, her dark hair, the remains of her dress, but it is no longer her. Sophia's earthly remains slowly dissipate and melt into the air. Her mother's eyes are filled with grief as she watches. She just hunches over and slowly walks back into the house. You can still hear the riders far away down the road. None of them even bothered to look back. Your friends walk away at a loss for words. You make your way home, dazed by what you have seen. You are still dazed as you retell these events to mother, unable to look up from the floor. After a moment of silence, she embraces you and calms you down. Lydia Brandt. Poor girl, what a terrible, painful death. But you must know that it was not her true death. By the twins' mercy, we're all given enough time in this world. Should you die before your time, you'll be brought back by their grace. For three times, they will rescue you from a terrible fate. But the fourth death is true and final for all. Every loss of life we were granted our, at our birth is a heavy blow to us, but the gods told us not to mourn a lesser death. Everybody will keep on living as though nothing has happened, even Sophia's parents. Their family is poor, and they have no family crypt like we do. When the girl's soul comes back to life, her body will be reborn in the city church with all her wounds healed. Do not mourn her, my son, but thank the twin gods for their justice. You see Sophia by her house a few days later, and she looks completely fine, without so much as a scratch. The other children tell you that her parents now forbid her to leave the yard after dying such an early first death. You call out Sophia's name. She looks at you briefly, then walks back inside. Sophia never talks to you again. I'm s I, I couldn't, I, I, I'm sorry. I would have, hmm. Actually, I won't lie to you guys. I'm kind of 50 50 on whether or not I would have stood in front of the horses because the last playthrough, we didn't do a whole lot with Sophia past this point. Like, we put her necks out for her a lot, but we never got anything in return. You know what I mean? So, honestly, I don't know if a death is worth paying here for the end game that we have. Year 1128. Adolescence, 10 years. Year 1128, fall, soil, and gunpowder. 
Sophia disappeared after the terrible incident with the horses. Her friends gossiped that her parents sent her off to serve a rich noble dynasty. You haven't seen each other since that day, but you still remember Sophia's eyes, the sunlight shining in them. But no matter what, life goes on. You are 10 years old now. Your studies continue and you are learning more about the land you live in. Anazot is an ancient city in an imperial province by the name of Magra. All soil in Magra was turned to ash eons ago, scorched by magic during the rebellion of Duke Shar Melanidus. The magical arts are all but gone now, but the scorched earth has remained barren and infertile ever since. Since then, the entire province is laid bare. Barren. Tormented by cold and scorching winds in equal measure, with few precious plants taking root on their own. All fertile land in Magra is bought elsewhere and brought here by an endless caravan of carts and carriages. To pay for food and soil, the cities of Magra became skilled in many trades, primarily mining and digging for metals and stone. Last fall, there was an explosion just outside the city, followed by clouds of thick smoke. The first such incident frightened the citizens, but then explosions and smoke became an everyday occurrence. Soon, everyone grew used to it. Father explains that the miners used a, a new invention called gunpowder. It makes it easier for them to reach the precious stones and metals buried deep within the earth. Then one day, a thunderous explosion rocks the city, and black, billowing smoke covers the houses. People are stuck in their homes, all windows tightly shut. The air is impossible to breathe. Nathan coughs all the time. Gloria and you cough only when nobody is watching. If mother hears it, she'll make you inhale those hot herbal vapors just like Nathan. It takes two days for the black smoke to disperse. People pour out onto the streets to make, meet their friends. Tomas is eager to share everything he knows about this incident with you. Tomas Guerrero. It took lots of burnt up people to the city temple. Mom told me she was helping the healers. There are many rumors. Some claim it was the work of a beast stirred from its slumber, while others say it's the surviving witches that continue to threaten the order in the Empire with their accursed powers. But as for you, you patiently wait for Father to come back home, and then you'll ask him about it. Father spends day and night working at the prefecture, while Mother spends her time in prayer. It takes a full week for Father to finally come home, and he's almost completely spent. You must muster enough courage during dinner to ask him what happened outside the city. Father raises his head, his face a bleak, weary mask, and starts muttering his proclamation. It's almost as if he doesn't see you. Robert Brent, it's the mine outside the city. They are trying to get to a vein of ore. There was an explosion. The mine caved in, and the black smoke started flowing. Many workers died there. It was all because Count El Velasco, who owns the mines, wanted them to start mining that vein before they were ready. Some of the workers weren't even reborn. Perhaps the twins thought their time, final time had come. The prefecture had been inundated with complaints from families that had lost their breadwinners, asking the judges for help. Many people also lost their cattle to the black smoke. Count El Velasco blames gunpowder for the dis disaster. The prefecture and the newspapers just repeat whatever he says but it's plain old greed and tyranny of both noblemen that are to blame. Why the welfare of our province is almost always paid for with common lives. Then, without warning, he grows silent again. You keep thinking about it for days. Can a human life really end so easily? A single moment of bad luck and you die only to reemerge from the temple or the family crypt with a new black mark on your arm or worse, you remain where you fell dead never to be reborn again ever order minus one peace wealth of magra plus one affluence i didn't get to do anything though stefan's arrival during lunch father tells you to stay home in the evening and prepare to meet some important guests your elder brother stefan will return home by dinner tonight joining him will be your grandfather gregor brandt as well as a noble friend of the family you are excited about your brother's return. It has been years since you last saw him. How has he changed during his years away from home? You and father await the guests anxiously. The doorbell rings. Three people are standing outside. Grandfather is the first one to come in, naturally. He has not changed a bit since his last visit, still eyeing the house with contempt, looking for any reason to demean it. 
Grandfather is followed by a stately young man dressed in a jacket, embroidered in silver, whom you barely recognize as your brother. Stefan casts a glance at your threadbare clothes, your dirty fingernails, and smirks. The last to enter the house is a personable gentleman with a worn out, wrinkled face. You have heard a lot about this man from father and grandfather. He is Baron Augustine Elborn, Stefan's uncle, a family friend, and the province's prefect, which means that he is the head judge and thus father's superior. Sir Elborn smiles lightly and offers you his hand. Augustine Elborn, can this best be your youngest son, Davin Jr., yes? You have your father's eyes, young man. Father bows slightly to Grandfather and Sir, El Sir Elborn, but there is a moment of quiet when Stefan's turn comes next. Father reaches out to him awkwardly, expecting an embrace. There is a question in Stefan's eyes as he looks at Grandfather. The old man shakes his head, almost imperceptibly. Stefan Brandt, we noblemen oughtn't put our emotions on public display, Father, not even after a lengthy separation. There is no embrace. Instead, Stefan nods to Father curtly. He responds in kind, his face devoid of emotion. After the greeting, you proceed to the sitting room. El Born is the first to enter. He kisses Mother's hand and Gloria's too, and tussles Nathan's hair after he sees him hiding by the table. Grandfather acknowledges them with a glum nod. Stefan Brandt. Greetings, Lydia Brunt. I remember you were kind to me when I was but a child, and you must be Nathan. You could barely walk when I saw you last. Your elder brother ignores Gloria completely. Not even a greeting. You proceed to the dining room in a dignified manner and take your seats. The dishes smell delicious, but they merely punctuate the overwhelming tension at the table. Elborn is the only one with a friendly smile on his face. Augustine Elborn. The dinner is splendid, Lydia. Did you choose the dishes yourself? You have a truly refined palate. It warms my heart to know Stefan spent his early years with you. Womanly care always does a child good, no matter the estate. Your fork freezes in the air halfway to your mouth. You expect many things from a noble of the sword, but words of praise for a lowborn woman, woman are not one of them. You cast a glance at Grandfather. He looks like he is about to choke on those words. Gregor Brandt. Would do my grandson more good to stay at the boarding school among his equals. Augustine Elborn. Please, Gregor. Parenting is no less important. Nothing can replace a mother's love. I cannot deny it. It saddens me greatly that my late sister could not be there to raise Stefan. But there was still a family for him, and he was surrounded by love. How could that be bad? And besides, his father was by his side all the while. A father's example is always the best. After all, Robert earned the judge's rank the same way you did. Your grandson was surely following your footsteps. And who knows, perhaps even the younger men of the Brandt family will contribute to the... Gregor Brandt. You clumsy lovelorn cretin. Everybody is startled by this sudden outburst. Grandfather's face turns red. He is glaring at a young lady servant holding a pitcher over a glass. Stefan is sitting right next to her, dabbing a napkin on a fresh stain on his jacket. Sorry, I needed to wet the old whistle here. Gregor Brandt. Be gone this instant. The lady servant runs away, leaving the pitcher on a small table by the door. After a quiet moment, Elborn smiles again. Augustine Elborn. It appears the servants have left us, yet dinner is far from over. Stefan Brandt. Where do you not, Uncle? There are enough commoners at this table to keep us served with food and drink. Stefan glares at Gloria across the table. She is sitting right next to you. She shrinks down and hunches over her under his gaze. Over under his gaze? Hunches over under his gaze. Father furrows his brows. Mother covers her mouth with trembling hands. Grandfather sneers. Stefan's gaze does not move. The silence lasts far too long. Then she starts to rise from her chair. Gloria, if the Brandt fan gentleman so wish it. Her hands clench into fists under the table. How can he bring himself to humiliate his own family, his own mother and a sister like this? It is all grandfather's doing. Stefan could not bring himself to embrace father without his permission. And yet they are noblemen and they have the right to act this way. If there is any way this dinner cannot become even more unbearable, you do not want to see it. So do we insult our brother? 
make small talk over dinner, or join Gloria in her play. If I remember right, last time we joined Gloria in her play, and I am going to actually... I'm going to run with the same one. I don't give two flying Fs what our grandfather thinks of us. It's as simple as that. He is going to die at some point, and I won't have to worry about it anymore. So... You deliberate for a moment, then take the napkin off your lap and rise to join Gloria. A moment later, you hear the sound of another chair moving. Your mother joins you. The three of you now refill glasses, serve food, and clear away dirty dishes. Sir Alborn tries to make small talk with father, but in vain. So he focuses attention on grandfather and Stefan. Grandfather is pleased to inform him of Stefan's achievements at the boarding school especially his exemplary sword fighting skills. He constantly stresses the importance of your elder brother for the future of the family. You listen to him dispassionately as you continue serving new dishes to the table. As you wait at the nobleman's table, you, your sister, and mother never bump into each other. Your labor is impeccable. Grandfather could not have found fault with it even if he had tried. Your shoulders and back are aching, but being a manservant inside your own house hurts even more. When the guests finally leave, Mother and Gloria embrace you with relief. You did not neglect your relatives and shared their humiliation. And the composure that you have shown gave you new strength. Hey, we got more willpower. You're 1,129, 11 years of age. A dropped handkerchief. Hot, dry winds sweep through the city from the barren lands around it. The noble residents of Anazot prefer to remain in their chambers, while the commoner, commoners huddle in tents or in the shade of the silver tree. You are on an errand right now. Your father wrote a letter to a noble acquaintance, and you are to deliver it. Tomas, the boy down the street, is tagging along. The two of you are inseparable now. The errand is an easy one, so you decide to take this opportunity to loiter around the part of Anazot where the nobles live. So here you are, in the middle of the city square, resting on the ancient brickwork by the old fountain in the merciful shade of the gargantuan silver tree. Tomas is by your side, lazily slouching on the edge of the fountain's basin. Tomas Guerrero, it's a hard life for commoners like you and me. Either you break your back in a workshop day and night, hoping someone will buy your goods someday, or you become a manservant to some noble. You never get a chance to enjoy life. This is our lot, you remind him. We work and endure and suffer. But Tomas waves your words away. Tomas Guerrero. Yeah, I know all that already. Mother keeps drilling that stuff into me. We must be humble. Our strength is patience and persistence. So yeah, I say, but... I want to make my fortune no matter what. So how, how ain't that living by my lot, I ask you? But the lots, they ain't easy. Let's take you for example, Brent. Your father's a nobleman, but even if that didn't make you one. Just look at your hands. You never had to work as hard as me, but we had the same lot, so we were supposed to suffer the same. Oh, excuse me. Or look at your father. He's a judge. He toils at the prefecture day and night doing this judging. And he's a noble? I've never seen an Arcanian work as hard as he does. You shrug. The Arcanians are a different race. The books say they were born to rule over humans. They are never commoners, always nobles of the sword by birth. They founded the empire after subduing all human kingdoms on the continent. Humans will never be their equals. Arcanians are always better, smarter, stronger, and their skin is a noble shade of blue. If the books are to be believed, of course, you have never seen one yourself. Your idle chatter is suddenly interrupted by a rugged looking guardsman dressed in black and green. He chases you away from the fountain. Common rabble like you have no place here. You hear the clattering of hooves and wheels against the cobblestones and see flags bearing a coat of arms. A sable serpent on a field of vert. It makes you squirm. It is the Archduke's coat of arms, the Melanidus dynasty. The carriage door opens, revealing a young lady in a luxurious dress. You cannot look away from her. Those dainty shoulders, suggested but not revealed by the cut of her dress. Her black hair cascading over them. Her stately, slim silhouette. Her pouty lips and prim nose. And those eyes, dark like the night sky, 
way she moves fluidly gracefully and most incredible of all her skin glows in azure blue she is a masterpiece given life she is an Arknian. Octavia Melanidus. Clear the way for me. The Melanidus guardsmen work quickly to clear the way to the fountain of the Arknian lady. The searing sun dances on her skin in bizarre patterns. With one elegant motion, she reveals a handkerchief, then leans over the basin and wipes her head and neck with its cool water. The Mosquero. Well, I'll be. That's Octavia Melanidus, our Archduke's own daughter. Daughter? Daughter. The Arcnian turns away and proceeds gracefully back to her carriage. You see something slip out of her hand and fall into the cobblestones right next to you. Her handkerchief. It is right there by her feet. Intricate craftsmanship. Expensive woven fabric. Delicately decorated with emerald filigree. Your heart skips a beat. Will you draw, dare draw the beautiful Arcnian's attention in order to return her lost possession? Or would you rather not attempt to cross the chasm between the sca chasm? Chasm. Chasm, 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 chasm. The chasm between you and her. Um, okay, so one of the dividing points on the last playthrough is that I actually decided to get in with Octavia, even though she was kind of a butthole. So I think I'm gonna go down the same path this time. I wanna see how that plays out. I don't wanna go so f like I said, I don't wanna go so far away from how we originally played it that the ending is unrecognizable from what could have been the ending in our previous playthrough. So we're gonna give the handkerchief back. What sucks is it's gonna reduce our willpower. I want more willpower, but I want to also follow the 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 line here. This way she'll remember me. It takes a moment to overcome your fear. You follow the young lady Melanidus and call out to her in a nervous voice. She turns around, her beautiful face marred by a puzzled expression. You extend the dropped handkerchief towards her. Lady Octavia's face consorts into a sneer. She signs to the guardsman indifferently. A guardsman gauntlet clad hand slaps you in the face. It rings your head like a heavy bell. Your nose cracks obediently under this staggering force. The rest of you follow suit and you fall prone. You can discern the guardsman's voice through the painful din in your ears. Should I take the handkerchief back, lady? Octavia Melanidus. After a commoner's hands have befouled it, let him wipe himself with it for all I care. The carriage drives away. Tomas runs up to you and drags you back to the fountain. Your head is still ringing from the blow. The fateful handkerchief is still crumpled in your hand. Well, so she, at least she remembers me now. We still have five points of willpower. I want to get more willpower, though. That's a big one for me. I need more willpower. Matters of the heart event has happened. Meet a girl. You experience your first romantic feelings. Year 1130. Adolescence. 12 years of age. Ba, 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 ba. Year 1130. Spring. The Quorum Decree. 12 years old now, you overhear an important conversation. It is spring night, and mother has just sent everyone to bed. You walk past father's study and hear voices coming from beyond the, the door. Grandfather is yelling, and father is rep replying quietly. The elder Brant men are fighting, arguing about the place of the commoners in the city. You sneak outside to avoid mother's attention and hide next to the window of the study. Perhaps they'll mention you too. Gregor Brant. That lowlife idiot had all the gall to pay me a visit and beg me for some service. He had the insolence to ask me outright. He thought I was going to support his claim for the chairman's seat in the lesser quorum. How dare he? Robert Brandt. Father, please listen. Mayor Egmont may be lowborn, but he carries a lot of clout in Magra. He owns five iron mines. A friend like him could be quite useful. Should he become the chairman of the lesser quorum? Gregor Brandt. I don't give a damn about who this Egmont is, Robert. What he is, however, is lowborn. His lot is humility and obedience. The likes of him can never rule with anything. They're nothing but a flock of sheep that need a firm, noble hand to guide them. I wasted so many years trying to quash that quorum decree, but the accursed Cornelius Tempest did everything in his power to make the Emperor sign that pathetic screed. And now even lowlifes can wield power. True power, Robert. Robert Brandt. Just the right act to discuss the size of the Archduke's tax. Nothing more. Gregor Brent. 
That is only the beginning. What's the next? Are they gonna arm the lowlifes now? Make them into judges? If the Empire rejects the foundations and they lots, the entire edifice will crumble. Bah! Who am I telling this to? It is already crumbling, and you, my son and heir, are a harbinger of this destruction. Robert Brandt. Father, I'm begging you, do not wish to marry I do not wish to marry a third time. Lydia is a good wife and a dutiful mother to my children. If you would only allow her to, Gregor Brent, I will allow them nothing, neither Egmont nor that freeloading wench of yours. What will you want me to do next? Live by the laws of the lowborn? I can already see where this is going, and I'd rather run my sword through my gut than live in a country where nobles and lowlifes share the same rights. Well, you better run that sword through your gut now. My only dream is to see the name of Brant in the blue book, but that dream will never come true. They will never call me Venerable L. Brant, and it's all because of this marriage of yours. Hold on, I gotta sneeze. Wait for it. Wait for it. <coughs> Excuse me. Wait, is there another one coming? I always sneeze in twos. Fun fact. It'll be a trivia question in the, in the year, in like the four or five year future YouTube question. How many times does Davin usually sneeze? Anyway, Gregor, Gregor Brant. <coughs> My only hope now is to hear Stefan address in such a manner one day. Thank the twins I didn't let you ruin the boy. He's about to grow up a true nobleman. His children will bear the name of L. Brent. Robert Brent, you have two more grandsons. Gregor Brent, those spineless milk stops from the common lot. They're incapable of anything. The best your middle son can do is sneak into the Imperial College and get noble by the mantle. Although I have grave doubts about even that. As for the downtrodden Nathan, I'll hold out no hope for him whatsoever. You hear grandfather's heavy footsteps, the thudding of his cane, and the slamming of the door. It's time to sneak back home before you're discovered. Power plus one equals three. Overseer in power. School begins, year 1130. You start studying at the school of Sir Tibber and begin to master the sciences. A storm of expectations. Finally, the day comes when the teacher stops coming to the house. But before you can breathe a sigh of relief and put away the books, father asks you to come to his study. Robert Brandt, you've grown, my son. It's time for you to continue your education away from home. I've chosen a deserving school for you. Sir Tibber's School for the Children of Noblemen and Well-Off Commoners. Naturally, it is not a boarding school for nobles, so you will study there during the day and come home in the evening. You share the news with your best friend, Tomas. Tomas Guerrero. Sir Tibber's School, eh? Yeah, I gotta ask my parents to send me there too as soon as they get the coin together. Father says his workshop has toiled day and night for years to save up for my education. The school was based in an ancient estate of Arkney and Design. The classrooms are tall, spacious, with massive benches, the sounds of scraping quills, and lectures on history and imperial law, and theology echo under the vaulted ceilings. The rules are strict, the lessons tiring. Restless Tomas keeps getting distracted, and several times gets his hand slapped with a stick for it. Every teacher demands flawless mastery of their subject. Every day, Father asks you about your studies. You have already told him twice about how Magra joined the Empire and how the Nobles' Court of Honor is different from the Commoner's Civil Court and their city prefecture. But Father keeps pressuring you to work even harder. When it is time to go to bed, Mother will not let you go to sleep until you recite a newly learned prayer for her. And when it is time to go to school, you promise her every day that you will behave with great humility and steer clear of insolent behavior of any kind. For you still live by the Commoner's lot, and that lot is hard work and suffering. Your first month in school draws to a close and the teachers announce that there will be exams at the end of the month to determine the best and worst students in each subject. Father insists that you devote all your spare time to studying law and history if you wish to follow in his footsteps. But when you speak to mother every day, you start considering theology. You still remember the revelations and divine visions that came to you in your earliest years. You have only one more day until the exam. You have locked yourself away in your room. It is already getting late. Your desk is covered with handwritten notes surrounded by leather-bound books. Just looking at them makes you queasy, but you have to read through all of them again, at least for one of your subjects. There is a nagging thought on your mind. Tomas ended up in big trouble the other day. He got into a fight with several boys who live next street. 
They heard about your wooden fortress and got in an outrage by the fortification built by commoners. They swore to dismantle it tonight. But Thomas swore he would defend the fortress until the very end. Perhaps you should abandon the books to rescue the friend in need. But then you hear your little brother Nathan knocking at the door. He stands there shyly, not saying a word. He often does that, standing still and saying, staying speechless until you either speak first or he runs away. But this time, he actually says something. Nathan Brandt. The door is locked. Are you okay, Devin Jr.? Is there anything I can do to help? Your head is spinning. This is the last evening before school exam. If you fail, your family will be very disappointed. You have to refresh your memory on law or theology, either one or the other. But Tomas and your fort are about to be stormed. Why today of all days? You grind your teeth and rage at the thought. Nathan is by the door, trying not to bother you. He wants to help you the only way he can, for reasons known only to him. Will you accept his help? Um... I think we passed the exams fine before. We're gonna actually spend a moment with Nathan, because I actually liked that decision from the last time. You cannot help but pay attention to your brother's quiet, weak voice. He pushed the books away. Nathan runs to you and wraps his arms around your legs. Nathan Brant. They should just leave you alone. I don't want you to get sick. Warmth emanates from his hands. You feel the burden of the responsibilities thrust upon you from your shoulders. At last, you realize something. You can make your own decisions rather than submitting to the will of others. You laugh at this realization and feel a new spring in your step. Nathan laughs with joy when he feels this. He takes your hand and pulls you outside. You've studied enough. You spend the rest of the evening playing with your little brother. Teach him how to build a watchtower out of wooden planks, sticks, and old rags behind the house. Nathan's success in construction leaves much to be desired, unlike his skill in covering himself with mud. Still, he is absolutely overjoyed. The morning comes. You barely have time to wake before you are walking to the menacing edifice of the school. The entire day is a constant flow of questions demanding answers. You give satisfactory responses on law and history. Although you are somewhat confused by the many technicalities and chronological orders, your knowledge and the interpretations of the lots leaves much to be desired. Your parents are dissatisfied with your performance. You know that you could have done and worked better. Still, you believe yesterday was not a waste. Hey, we got some willpower back. Anytime I get willpower, I am happy. It means doors open for us. Oh, it's the kooky music again. Your education continues. It's changed tunes on me right when I was about to get into it. I apologize. Your education continues. As you study imperial law, you come to realize that there is a certain hierarchy even within the noble estate. It seems your father's status is not quite equal to that of the more eminent human in Arcanian gentry. You return home with this new information at your disposal. Father asks you about school after dinner, as he always does. Robert Brand. And what is the difference between nobles of the mantle and those of the sword, Davin Jr.? You already have an answer ready. The letter's status is hereditary, meaning that it is passed down from father to son. After the Arcneans, nobles of the sword are the most eminent humans in the empire. They own lands and estates. They fill offices of the highest ranks, and the names of their bloodlines are preserved within the Great Book, the Great Blue Book, even. Nobility of the sword can only be granted. Wait, nobility of the sword can only be granted by the overseer of the province or the emperor himself. Robert Brandt. And how much are such eminent people addressed? And how are such eminent people addressed? With the honorific L before their last name, you respond. Sir Augustine L. Bourne, for example. Father pats you on the shoulder, clearly impressed. Robert Brandt. And what about the Arcneans and their status? What have you learned about them? The Arcneans stand above all human gentry. They are born to rule over humans, regardless of their titles. No L is required when addressing them. They need no honorifics, for the names of their ancient dynasties are known to all. Father nods somberly. Robert Brandt. 
Yes, we can never be their equals. Do whatever an Arcanine tells you and never defy them. Ever. Ever, ever, ever. And what about grandfather and me? Where do we stand as nobles? That is easy. Father and grandfather are nobles of the mantle. This title cannot be inherited, but it can be earned by a commoner as a reward for the great service to the Empire in the Legion or as a civil servant. Father suddenly grows quiet and looks you in the eye intently. Robert Brandt. Yes, and someday you will earn a noble title too, son. All in due time. Sons of the nobility. Sir Tibber's school teaches children of all the stripes. Nobles of the mantle and lowborn parents can see their sons here. And every passing day, the children of the noblemen invent new ways to snub and bully the commoners. Most of the time, the bully leading them is Diedric. Diedric? Diedric. The son of the secretary for the imperial chancellery and a self-important slob. The sons of noblemen never pick on you, however. They know that your father has been a noble by the mantle. However, Diedric and his retinue soon choose Tomas as their favorite victim. Time and time again, you ask your friend not to pay them any mind. But again and again, Tomas grows angry and snaps at their self-satisfied mockery. It is early morning. The students are busy flocking to the classroom for the next lesson. You wave Tomas over when you see him. He waves back at you, and then a bucket is full of slop splashes on him. Needless to say, it is the work of Diedrich and his entourage. You hear his familiar creaky laughter. The tailor's son stinks. How dare he sit next to decent folk? Tomas clenches his fists. Tomas Guerrero. You're dead, Diedrich. He throws himself at Diedrich's hofty entourage like a soldier wage ready to wage war. He attacks him first. This is just what they expected, and they are free to retaliate. He barely makes one movement before four pairs of hands grab him at once. Diedrich snares and kicks your friend in the belly. Tomas gasps for air and starts coughing. You stand between them as Diedrich readies another kick. The nobleman's son cocks an eyebrow. Why do you mingle commoners, he asks. Your father is a noble of the mantle, and you ought to be friends with your own kind. Your equals, not the dirt beneath your feet. Behind him, four boys hold Tomas down as he struggles furiously. The other students are watching you, frozen in fear. Diedrich hoftily extends a hand to you. He clearly expects you to shake it. What will you do? I will am not. Uh, I like the choice of admonishing the nobleman's sons last time. You make a speech not to bully lead bully. Mm. Let me restart. You make a speech not to the lead bully himself, but rather to his retinue. How come Diedrich sees himself fit to instigate fights? His fa family may be higher in rank, but like everyone else here, he has yet to take the nobleman's sacrament himself. The nobleman's lot is not yet his, so he is not yet fit to fight or rule, nor are any of you. The twin gods are ever watching over us, and you add, and they are ever vigilant. Do you dare to defy their will? Diedric tries to retort. They've broken no laws, he says. All they've done is teach commoners the meaning of suffering. You call upon the knowledge gained from your theology lessons and easily pick his argument apart. Every man's first duty is to follow his lot, and Diedric and his friends lack the humility to accept that they are not yet true nobles. The hands holding Tomas down grow weaker. There is a whisper among the students around you. You're right. The twins are always watching how we follow the lots. Diedrich's retinue quickly dissolves in embarrassment. He fiercely orders them to come back and join his cause, but his ex exer exhortations, exhortations, exhortations are all in vain. The other boys are clearly impressed by your words. The noble children will think twice before acting out again. Plus one sympathy for Thomas Guerrero. Spirituality plus one. I don't care. I don't want spirituality. Get it out of here. Year 1131. 13 years of age. The Silver Tree. Your theology teachers tell you more about Amazon. It is more than just the provincial capital. It is also a sacred place blessed by the gods. It is where the twin gods' first disciples spilled their blood, and from that blood grew the sacred silver tree. 
Its enormous foliage hangs over the city. You see its branches in the sky every day, but you have never approached the trunk of the tree yourself. Today, you will be taking your first step to the silver tree. Your class is visiting service in the great temple by the tree's very roots. Thanks to your theology teacher, you and the other students will witness the landmark of the twins' advent up close. Everybody is excited. Soon, you and the other boys enter the slums surrounding the church district of Anazot. The roots are pulsating under your feet. They spread underground all throughout the area. Pathetic, cramped hovels and filthy streets surround the trunk of the tree. They are home to paupers, day laborers, and preachers. The people of the district humbly bow to you and point you towards the temple. They seem at peace despite the abject poverty in which they live. All who live directly beneath the tree are filled with its divine grace, your teacher says. People come here to make peace with the world and their fate in it. Your class is unusually quiet. Everyone is listening to the rustling of the leaves and the underground beating of the roots. The sky above you is obscured by the tree's canopy. You find the temple of the twin gods right next to the tremendous trunk of the tree. It almost seems a part of it. There is a crowd there, pilgrims dressed in traveling clothes, paupers and beggars, common peoples of the city, and occasional well-dressed nobles. There are arguments among some people who are gathered in separate small groups. Many people are wandering around, staring upward at the tree's branches. The tree impresses you with its might and the calm emanating from it. You are filled with the desire to sit down and think of the world, to learn something about yourself, to touch the silver white bark and hearken to the whispering leaves. You are distracted enough to fall back from the rest of your classmates. You notice a small path. It should take you right next to the trunk. A tall red-haired woman walks out of the crowd of pilgrims. She is wearing a warden white robe. She is no longer young, but her face is youthful and covered in freckles. Her hands clutch a book. You have never seen this lady pilgrim before, yet she looks at you almost as if she has recognized a lifelong friend. She beckons you and says her name, Matilda, a preacher from Astinia. What she says next shakes you to your very core. It is commendable to see a young man so keen to learn the teachings of the twins, she says. Yet you will never follow the light of the truth within the light of walls of the temple. Inside you will find only the lies about the lots, the erring words of Prophet Isatius sanctified by the passage of centuries. Yet anyone who sets out to read the accounts of the twins' own lives knows that they never so much as mention the lots. The red-haired preacher's words frighten you. They clash with everything you've heard from Mother. Everything you've been taught at school. The lots? Or a lie? You freeze in fear. Should you argue with Matilda or you ask her for more information? Or should you treat her as a madwoman and catch up with your classmates? You suddenly feel a small warm hand get grasp your own. You see a girl next to you. She is just a little older than you, wearing a black dress, threadbare yet almost spotless. Her hair is covered by a handkerchief with only a single golden lock showing. Her brown eyes are burning with rage, her hand pulling you away from the red-haired preacher. You stare in confusion at the strange young girl, your cheeks flushed by the sudden touch. There is just a bit of color on her cheeks too, but then she starts speaking to you quickly. Yan, don't listen to her, she's dangerous. Come to the temple with me, only there will you see the truth. You stand there, surrounded by the crowd of praying pilgrims and the sounds of shuffling feet torn between two people you have never seen before and each of them expects you to follow her but all the while you hear the whispering of the wind in the tree's branches the branches reach out for you almost as if the tree wishes to speak to you itself can you hear its voice can you hear its voice follow the girl in the temple give in to the epiphany stay with the red-haired pilgrim leave them and approach the tree um Oh, I can't do this. I don't have insight, so I didn't die. Um, I think I'm going to leave and, and approach the tree. I don't want to get invested in either of the churches. The silver tree. The tree is beautiful. A silver white foliage stretches and spreads towards the sky, held aloft by a trunk so thick it would be a challenge to walk around it. The leaves rustle and whisper peacefully in the wind. The tree, it seems to speak to you. 
You walk away from the odd-looking preacher and the young acolyte, ignoring them as they call out to you. You walk around the temple, and the crowd of people getting closer to the tree with every step. Then you extend a shaking hand and touch the bark. It is unusually warm. You can feel a pulse beneath the roots. The tree is alive. The roots are also gigantic. They form large grottos, spaces of air embraced by the roots and the ground. You squeeze into one of the grottos. It is unusually bright and quiet, shielded from the noise of Anazot. Right now, there is only you and the tree. You sit down. There are leaves rustling all around you. The only noise you hear is the beating pulse of the life that flows through the tree. And this pulse beats in time with your heart. You feel clarity and calmness, free of doubt and frustration. The tree speaks to you, or are, are they your own thoughts? So strange, unfamiliar, and eye-opening? These thoughts speak of soothing love and of crystal clear law and of love and law intertwining to bring the miracle of life to you. You stop slouching and your frown becomes a light smile. Hours pass by like fleeting seconds. You lose track of time until you overhear someone shouting your name. Alas, it is time to leave this grotto. The sun is setting over Anazot now. The day was quick to pass. Your teacher frowns, ready to scold you. You mumble an explanation and say you are ready to be punished for disobedience. Yet, the, instead the teacher nods in understanding. You keep looking back at the tree all the way home. Whatever happened to you today, you find it difficult to put into words. Willpower. Yay, more willpower. And on that note, we are going to start the Shadow of the Past in the next playthrough. We are at about an hour right now. Um, let me know what you guys think of this reading. I'm really trying to improve on my voice and my delivery, my enunciation. Hopefully I did a little bit of a better job maybe projecting for you guys or enunciating, maybe reading down like a little bit slower so it's easy to understand. Please let me know if I'm improving or if it's just I'm hot garbage in the, in the, in the comments below. Otherwise, again, as always, I do appreciate anybody that takes the time to watch this. I, I'm trying to make a few different decisions. I think the biggest decisions that I've changed in this one is I've saved another life through Sophia. The decision that was made there was different. And then I made a different choice on... I got to try to remember. The tree was different as well. But there was another one that was different. I can't think of it off the top of my head right at this moment. But there was a couple of different options that I chose. A lot of it was the same. But at this point, we're uh, plus two on lives compared to where we were before. If Who knows how the last playthrough would have happened if we had kept those two lives. Now, again, as always, I appreciate everybody that took the time to watch this video. Appreciate you all. I love you all. I hope you guys are having a fantastic day. I'll catch you guys in the next video. I will be trying to upload one hour increments every day. Again, leading up to the next playthrough, uh, which is going to be Arkham Horror, which is a, a, a HP Lovecraft-esque game, which is coming out on the 23rd. Feel free to check it out on Steam. Again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, I think, upload the trailer for it to the channel just so people that maybe are already subscribed to the channel can check it out maybe if they get interested in it or not uh i'm gonna say it again i appreciate y'all i love y'all and again have a great rest of your day i'll catch you guys in the next video peace nope you said 30 seconds 10. I have no idea, I'm not even watching. Uh, no comment. <laughs>